Today I want to talk about the term midlife crisis. It's something I hear about a lot and I do read about it a lot, but I think the original term that was coined in 1965 by a psychoanalyst, I think it's been uh, not used correctly, I think it's been abused. Uh, I think it's sometimes used as a sexist term. I think it's used to shame people. And I just don't think that word or the term midlife crisis is helpful in being empathetic to the real issues that people have as they get older. So I think we should be a lot more caring than just throwing out the term midlife crisis, like it's some kind of a shaming tactic that people use. So thus the, uh, the subject for today. Let's start with the term midlife crisis. Now, the guy behind me, Jimi Hendrix, let's take him for example. He died when he was 27 years old. So I, I, what was his midlife crisis when he was 13, 14 years old? So I think we have to just start with that, is the fact of just the thought that we believe that everybody lives to be 80 years old and they only experience a midlife crisis between 40 and 60 years old, is not really looking at the reality of life. And it's not looking at all of the many, many emotional challenges that human beings go through all the way from the cradle to the grave. So to be more specific, I want to take a look at a general definition of what a midlife crisis is for quote-unquote women, and then we'll look at it from the men's point of view, and then we're going to look at it for what it really is. So I want to read this just so uh, I get it exact. So here it is, midlife crisis in women. It can affect women between 40 to 60 years old. It affects about 20 to 25% of women in that age group. And it's defined as a period of life to make choices to live out their dreams that may have been sidetracked in a woman's younger years. And this can lead to midlife development. Now, a couple of shows ago, we talked about the differentiation or the individuation of self. And this is really what we're talking about here. So I think in this sense, the definition of midlife crisis is a very positive one because the technical term would be differentiation of self, which we discussed at length, I think uh, two, two shows ago. Now here's the image, so to speak, of a woman going through midlife crisis. A woman finally becoming who she wants to be after many years of doing what other people and what society wanted her to do and and they kind of directed her life now she's going to go out and do things on her own so again I totally agree that um, obviously a woman who is finally finding who she is and what she wants to be and how she wants to define herself they're all positive things now let's look at the average midlife crisis in men or so it's been categorized these days now Interestingly enough, it affects only about 10% of men. But when we talk about midlife crisis, we tend to only say that it's a man's issue. Definition. Men are feeling their age. They're aware that their youth is gone. They feel trapped in an identity or lifestyle they don't like. They feel pressure to break out and may desperately grasp at a chance for vitality and pleasure. This can result in as much anxiety, stress, and depression for the man as it is for all the people who care about them. Okay, now that sounds very negative, right? I think we can all agree on that. And it's, for some reason, the definition of midlife crisis for women has radically changed for men. Now here's the image. We have a man buying a red Lamborghini and then having an affair with a 20 year old stripper, thereby ruining his family. So again, this is not a psychological term. This term was hijacked by I don't know whoever, journalists and just people who have blogs and people who have YouTube shows that have no education, and they really ruined what it, what it really is. So yes, it can be uh, misused and it doesn't reflect the human condition. So let's look at a more realistic definition of what a midlife crisis is and maybe it can help people. So definition, a challenge that causes a person to reevaluate their priorities their directions in life, and who they are as a person. And this may lead to physical, emotional, or spiritual adjustments in their life. Life will challenge you to adapt to a changing environment. And this challenge could come from the individual, 
or from life itself. And the last part there, the change could come from the individual. Again, somebody could look at their life and say, well, I want to achieve more, I want to achieve something different, you know, as they're looking over their life. And, you know, that's one section. But sometimes life itself makes you change, such as the, the, the death of a partner or you lose your job. So no matter what, in life, life is a series of changes, and you're going to go through what could be a crisis at any time. And I think that's very normal for human beings. So I, again, we need to throw away the term midlife crisis as some type of negative thing that's hurting other people. And I think we also have to take a look at the age groups because I think we minimize greatly the amount of emotional stress that goes through children and through adolescence and young adulthood because we minimize that. We think that this crisis only happens during your midlife, and I think that's absolutely untrue. And because of that, we, we don't have the empathy and the compassion for children that we should. So there's probably a million examples, so let me just give you a few that I can think of off the top of my head. Now, everybody out there can probably remember the first day of school. I know I do. Now, I remember my first day of school with almost all the kids crying. Now, I didn't cry that day. Uh, my mom told me that she would buy me a kitten if I was able to walk to school, get through the whole school day without crying, and then walk home. And I did that. So I got my cat or my kitten when I was five years old. But looking back on that, half the kids were crying and they were scared to death to be in that class. And well, why shouldn't they? Because it's a complete identity change and it's an emotional challenge. Up until that point, they probably had five years straight of a mother or father or both parents taking care of them at home and doting on them all the time. And then all of a sudden, they're being forced to go to this building with a bunch of children they don't know and they're gonna be there for, I don't know, six, seven, eight hours. And it's extremely scary and I think we forget that. Now, how about when they graduate? I remember graduating from sixth grade, how scary that was. In, when I was in sixth grade, I had a class of 30 kids. Then I was gonna go into a junior high that had about 1,100 kids in it. I was scared to death. And plus, I, then I thought, well, I would lose my placing as like a really good athlete, because at that time, figure out there's only 15, 15 boys in my class. Now I was going up against 500. So I was completely scared to death of starting junior high. And then you have to meet all these new teachers. So again, the, it's extremely difficult to go through for a child. How about if you're a child and your parents divorce? Does that change your identity? Absolutely it does. How about the first time you actually have a romantic relationship? You know, how important that is for everybody and how it changes everybody. And of course, the inevitable, that breakup, and you feel like your life is over. Again, is that a crisis? <laughs> At that age, absolutely, but we don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about only people between 40 and 60 years old and make it a bad thing, right? How about that first time you go in there for your first real job and how scared you are to make sure that you can actually do the job and now you're being bossed around by somebody else other than your parents? And the inevitable, which would happen to me, how about being fired and being rejected and having to tell everybody that you, you're not even good at scooping ice cream at the local ice cream parlor, how embarrassing is that? How about when you get married? That's stress. How about, is that a change of identity too? Absolutely, from a single person to a married person? It's a massive identity change. So really when we're using the term midlife crisis, we're really looking at an identity crisis and that's the term that we really probably need to use. How about if you get divorced, how about all those people who, I mean, people who get married, how about those, all those people who get divorced? There's an identity change for you that may actually, if you don't handle that correctly, it may ruin the rest of your life. It may make you bitter, you know, towards people. How about if you have children? Does that change your identity? Of course it does. How about in a divorce and you lose those children? Or you lose them at least half the time? Of course it does. Any type of trauma, uh, accident, uh, surgery, uh, your parent, as you get older, your parents die. That's a tough one. How about your spouse dying, uh, your child dying, uh, your pets, I had enough of that. So again, I can, I can reiterate this a million times. Uh, 
This term should never be used again. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's uh, reductive. I think it's harmful. And it doesn't really look at the human condition as it is. Let's say you want to develop a skill. Uh, I try to develop my skill on the guitar here a little bit. Again, I'm not great, but I try. Or how about in any sport? Do you have an emotional challenge there? Well, you actually do, each and every day. Every time you go and do a sport, there's probably somebody trying to beat you. So, of course, there's a crisis. Somebody's trying to win. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to lose. How about uh, take all the uh, people out there, such as myself, most of my life. I worked for myself. So, every day, as far as I see it, I'm unemployed. So I go out in terms of I don't work for a company, I work for myself. It means basically that, you know, I'm a raider, I'm a pirate. I don't fly under anybody's flag. I fly under my own flag. And all the money I get is based on my own value that I can give to other people and the service I can give to other people. And that can be scary sometimes because if you lose a client, you, it, it directly affects you. Whereas if you work for somebody, you can lose 10 clients, you can lose big accounts, and if you still hold your job, you still hold your job. Now again, in terms of the uh, term midlife crisis, I don't think everything is a crisis. I think in some ways we have to understand that it's very, very poor planning on some people's parts. In other words, some people can get very uh, complacent in their life, and they turn around and they go, oh, 5, 10, 15... <coughs> 20 years have gone by and then they turn around and they go oh wh where'd my life go well that's very sad I mean that's part of the existential crisis is it not of course it is but there's only one person to blame and that would be yourself so when we talk about midlife crisis is it a crisis or is it just a failure to plan is it a failure to really ask yourself the tough question that I end up asking myself almost every day. Am I just another number in this world or am I actually making a difference? I talked to a person, let me say I talked to a bunch of people, but I wanna make it one person. Let's call it a composite of a bunch of people I've talked to since I've been doing therapy for the last bunch of years. And I'll, I'll start off a conversation. What did you do today? They'll say nothing. What did you do in the last year? Nothing. What did you do in the last year? Nothing. I said, do you have any achievements that you can look back on? And they'll say, well, no. I'm like, well, have you tried? They'll say, no. I'm like, well, what, what gets you out of bed in the morning? And they'll say, well, I, I have to pee. And I'm like, well, okay, here's a person that they may or may not ever have a midlife crisis because, number one, they don't care enough about their life to really examine and reevaluate their life. So in that sense, I would say if you want to call it a midlife crisis, I think that's a very good thing because you're taking a look at what's going on in your life and you're trying to have some type of development. And so from there, a person like this, they might finally look at their life and go, oh my God, what, why did I waste all this time? And there's no time like the present to come to that conclusion that you can be more and that you're actually worth something and you can try to actually fulfill your potential. The other part of a midlife crisis, I think, uh, for me, is this. is just the basic reality. is that when we really get down to it, life is not that much more than a series of hellos and goodbyes. For me, what does that mean? It means that when somebody says, oh, you're having a midlife crisis and that means you're searching for your youth, I would say absolutely not. I would say that I think everybody fights to be seen. I think everybody fights to be relevant. And in our very capitalistic, very youthful society, I think a lot of older people they start to lose power over time. So if you were a model in your 20s, and now you're approaching 40, you may want to look at some other avenues. So it's not that we need to look at it that is a negative. You can look back at your experiences and your accomplishments and smile. And that was a hello at that point. And you embraced it. But maybe now 
we need to do something else. And so in this particular quote-unquote crisis, we need to say goodbye to that and hello to something else. And I think that is the cure, in a sense, is that I've talked to a lot of older people over the years, and when they retire, the ones who do well, the ones who are happy, the ones who live long, productive lives after they retire, they all tell me the same thing is that they don't retire necessarily. They retire from one phase of their life or one way how they extracted money from a capitalistic society, but they retire into something else, no matter what that might be. It might be a small business. It might be golf. Whatever it is that, that keeps you going. Now, another question might be, and I get this a lot, do you think men are more affected by this midlife crisis, or what I would like to call, are men more affected by life challenges, emotional challenges, than women? And the answer to that is, I, I really don't know. I think everybody's different, so we, let's just start with that. But uh, Dr. Karen Hornet, and she was a psychoanalyst, I believe she, was, uh, she worked with Freud. She had a, a really interesting theory. It's called womb envy. Now, I think everybody's heard of penis envy, where Supposedly, Freud said that women, they have penis envy, but really it's not that, right? It's not the body part. What it is, is that they wanted the power. They wanted the control. They wanted to be able to be treated equally. And I can understand that. No problem, but that's not today's show. Today's show would be on womb envy. Do men have more difficulty going through, quote unquote, midlife crisis than women do? And I would say by percentage, they probably do. And I don't know if Dr. Hornet is correct, but what she says is, is that because women have the ability to get pregnant and they give birth, there's, the child is intimately a part of their body. So when they have a child, that, that child is very connected to them. Now, obviously, bio, biologically, a man contributes to creating a child. We all know this. But there's a disconnect because men don't go through pregnancy that most men, not all, but most men feel very disconnected to their children in that sense. So when a man talks about having a legacy or being able to be alive after he's dead, so to speak, a man speaks of a business. He speaks of a building with his name on it, a bridge with his name on it, a book with his name on it. And I'm not saying women don't do that. Of course they do. And in this day and age, the year 2020, they do it more and more. But by and large, over the years, especially when uh, Dr. Verne was coming up with a theory, women were more in tune with their legacy by the children or the child that they bring to this earth. And so because of that, she says, again, that men are not as connected to their children, that they see that they need to build up a business or something else to outlive them. So in that sense, uh, she would probably say, yes, uh, men definitely have more difficulty growing old than, than women do. Take that for what it's worth. I can't prove it. Just a theory. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, throw it away. So what's my answer to all this? Again, let's throw away the term midlife crisis. Let's talk about an ongoing life challenge that all of us have to go through if you really care about your life, right? If you really want to do well in life, if you really want to reach your full potential, if you have pride of ownership of who you are as a person for this even if you live to be 100, that's such a short amount of time in terms of the universe. You know, what are you gonna do with your time? So I'm reminded of this saying that says, uh, Rome was not built in a day. And I like that saying, and I think everybody, we think we know what it means. You know, it means that things take a long time, right? Like, don't let things get you down. Rome wasn't built in a day. It's gonna, you gotta keep going. But that's not entirely accurate. Let's get a little bit more accurate. To be more accurate, Rome was actually never fully built. And what does that mean? 
It means that at any given time, there were people working on building Rome. They were trying to make it better. They were constructing it at that time. So it wasn't like, there it is, there's Rome, it's built. It's always in the constant flux and motion of being built. Because even if you want to maintain who you are and maintain what you have and you stay at that level, the world keeps moving on. And so that means technically you are moving backwards. So everything is always a work in progress. So we need to adapt each and every day. So again, the term, quote unquote, midlife crisis shouldn't hit you at a specific time, at a specific place. It's not somewhere between the ages of 40 and 60. I think it's every single day of your life, you know, you can do it when before you put your head on that pillow before you go to bed. You know, I do this. Go back through your day and say, what could you have done better? How could you have been a better service? What did you need to know that could make you a better person? What could you have done to make yourself more valuable? Who did you hurt that day? Is there something that you left unsaid that you should have said? Is there something that you said that you shouldn't have said? And I tend to do that on a daily basis, usually before I go to bed, but I also like that time when I wake up in the morning because I wake up when it's dark out and I usually go to, to either work or to work out four or five o'clock in the morning. And I love that time. It's a little bit colder. It's totally dark. Nobody's out on the road. And it gives me time to think about who the person I want to be that day is because everything you do is a choice. You know, I hear this a lot too. Somebody will say, well, I've always wanted to lose some weight. Well, did you know that you could literally starve to death in six weeks? Like you can die of starvation in only six weeks. So I'm not saying to do that, obviously. But what I am saying is somebody who's tried for 40 or 50 years to lose weight and they haven't, it means you really maybe haven't tried hard enough. Because technically, if you made the decision to, to really focus in on that, if that's what you want to do, I mean, you, like I said, you can die of starvation in only six weeks. So you can't tell me it takes 60 years to you know, lose a couple of pounds. Or if you want to go back to school, you know, why can't you do that? You know, it's funny, when I went back to school when I was like 40 years old, somebody said, well, you know, it's going to take you, I don't know, five years to get through that. You'll be 45. And I said, right, but if I don't go to school in five years, I'll still be 45. But I'll be 45 without the education that I want. And I will be less, <laughs> less valuable to the universe and I'll be less valuable to me. So the point is, one more time. It's up to you. You know, do the best you can in life. You know, the person that I've talked about before that has no achievements and they don't want to achieve anything, the honest truth is they may never, they probably won't ever have a midlife crisis because they don't care enough. Too much apathy, too much boredom of themselves, too much lack of care about the world, no intellectual curiosity. How sad. So let me leave you with this, just in case you don't wanna go with my term of ongoing life challenge, you wanna use the term midlife crisis because everybody does. Let's all hope we have a good midlife crisis. And let's hope we have that midlife crisis almost every day, because that's what helps us be better people. So my name is Joe Peroni, and this is the Rise Above Project, and hopefully you found today's show, val uh, today's show valuable. I hope you subscribe, and even better, if you can, I would really like it if you sent it to a few friends. Thank you very much.